Welcome to Share, a podcast production of Amethyst Recovery Centers. I'm your host, Kavir Singh. At the top of each episode, we like to remind our listeners that addiction is treatable and recovery is possible. If you or a loved one are struggling with addiction, call Amethyst today at 855-80-SOBER or visit us online at amethystrecoverycenters.com. Mental health struggles are sometimes referred to as invisible because people on the outside may not know what you're experiencing. The same is true for certain chronic illnesses like endometriosis. The fact that people might not see your symptoms can lead to a dismissal from healthcare providers and added stigma. Tracy Diamond is a poet, literary artist, and library events coordinator in Baltimore. She writes on her blog, which we'll link to the show notes, about living with endometriosis and searching for quality care. Today, we're talking to Tracy about how she sees the intersection of chronic illness and mental health. Hi, Tracy. Welcome to Share. Hi, Kabir. It's great to be here with you. Of course. Thanks for thanks for joining us. Although the, the world has um, <clears throat> become a lot closer through technology, it's cool to know that that you're nearby here in, in Baltimore and, and that you are you know locally involved in our, our communities here. Um, as, as you are likely aware, you know our our, our headquarters is in Owings Mills, and so mm-hmm. it's always cool to have someone uh, from close by. So you you've written about symptoms which are which are discounted by doctors. Um, well, let, let let me back up, I guess, because uh, for the listener here, endometriosis, mm-hmm. the definition, or what is endometriosis? Yes. So endometriosis, um, how doctors understand it now. And actually, I think part of why there is um, so much difficulty with getting a diagnosis is because not everyone has the correct definition. But the correct definition is that endometriosis is when tissue that is similar to the endometrium is found outside of the uterus. And so the endometrium is in the uterus and granted, I'm not a doctor, but this is how I've learned about it and read about it. Um, The endometrium is in the uterus, but this tissue that is found outside of the uterus leads to inflammation and pain. It adheres to all sorts of, uh, they found it in every organ from, you know, in the pelvic region, which people might think of endometriosis as a pelvic condition because it often is first noticed when someone perhaps is experiencing infertility, but it's been found in the brain. It's been found in the lungs. It's something that's really unfortunately found everywhere. And until there's an understanding of why it's everywhere, Um, that's why so many of us have so many issues with it as a chronic condition. Well, thank you for explaining it. I like to think that I'm a really smart guy and that I've heard heard about everything in the world. I, I, I literally have never heard of this word before. And so thank, thank you for, for dropping a little bit of that education on myself and, and those out here listening. Um, so I guess back to what I was leaning into and then talked about endometriosis you've written about symptoms being discounted by doctors and how that experience, you know, can be common among people with endometriosis. Why do you think that this issue persists? There are a lot of different issues that lead to it. Um, And I also want to say close to the top that you know, I'm not speaking for the full endometriosis community. This is really my experience as, you know, a middle-class white woman, but endometriosis just seems to be discounted because there is this stigma around periods. Um, you know, I mentioned it can be considered a pelvic and reproductive issue because that's one of the other places it a main symptom shows up where you generally can have a very heavy period flow. 
Mm -hmm. um, but then there's also systemic racism in the healthcare community where black women face even more difficulty getting diagnosed because some doctors still believe that if you're black, you don't feel pain like a white person or someone else might feel because endometriosis hasn't been researched like other chronic conditions like diabetes. Um, they just don't understand what causes it. So you're often, um, the term that I hear a lot is medical gaslighting, where if you go into the doctor and talk, you're talking about chronic pain, your doctor will say things like, we'll just go on birth control, just get pregnant, just take Advil when you have your period. Like you haven't tried anything before going into your doctor to say something's wrong and I need help. So when you were, is, is diagnosed the right word for this? Or, or when you found out, um, is that, do you feel lucky that you had a, a, a level or quality of care that gave you access to figure this out? Perhaps you're involved, I don't know if you are or not, um, I know you're involved in a lot of stuff in the, in the Baltimore area, as I highlighted during the intro, mm -hmm. um, but marginalized communities, um, other, so that you mentioned, uh, so were you lucky to figure this out? Um, so even with all my privileges, it took 10 years for me to get diagnosed. I remember going to my pediatrician and saying that my periods were really heavy, really painful. And, you know, that's when I was first told, you know, make sure you take Advil you're too young for birth control, which I'll add is not a way to treat endometriosis. The only way to treat endometriosis is to remove the endometriosis. And so that takes surgery and it often just takes a really long time to get access to that surgery because if a doctor doesn't even know what endometriosis is or doesn't really understand it as more than just something that might affect your fertility, they're not going to refer you to a surgeon. Yeah, that's uh, not exactly the same thing. I recently had an experience um, as a 45-year-old male, which is the new 50 with colonoscopies. Um, I, I was recommended to, to, or was given a referral to do that my current healthcare provider um, did not, has not adjusted their guidelines for, for that. So it's, it's, it's you know, so I have to wait five more years, God knows, what, or, or, or pay for it myself. So I, I can certainly understand. And, and as I think about everything that you're saying, wow, somebody with, with a lack of resources, women, you, you mentioned, you know, Black women that, um, are, are certainly discounted as a population that with, with regards to pain and, and endometriosis, um, you know, that are there in Baltimore City, let's just go ahead and say, having little to no access to, um, you know, care surrounding this. It's, it's, I, I can see how that, that uh, is a long road, you know, 10 years, uh, that, that's incredible. And, yeah. you know, the impact, how, there's a certain period of time, I suppose you, I don't want to put words in your mouth. You, you felt as you were dismissed, I guess, by doctors. Yeah, I felt dismissed. It really does, at least for me, it made me feel like maybe I really was unhinged. Maybe it was all in my head. You know, it's isolating because when you don't even know that you have a condition and you don't even know the name of it, you, you can't when you try and talk about it, you're just talking about these vague symptoms of being exhausted, having a lot of pain, and not really feeling like you have a community you can turn to. So are, are there support communities surrounding this? Yes, there are a bunch and a bunch locally, which is really cool. Um, so one of the biggest, well, and I wouldn't necessarily call it a support community, it's more um, an educational community, is the Facebook group Nancy's Nook. And so that has um, 
as of this, as of recently, they have over 130,000 members wow. of people searching for quality endometriosis care because either they've had botched surgeries or they've, you know, finally at least learned about endometriosis as a condition, but they have been told to get pregnant, which, you know, isn't necessarily in everyone's life plan. And, you know, why would you feel ready to take care of a child if you're in con chronic constant pain? Um, so Nancy's Nook has a bunch of resources built by Nancy Peterson, who's a nurse and other people who guide you through all the different, um, the potential treatments, what surgery might look like. Um, and then there's the group Endo Black, which is for black women. And it's actually um, organized by someone outside of the DMV. There's also Endo Queer, also organized by someone outside of the DMV, um, Les Henderson. And so that's a Facebook group and an Instagram page that you can go to. Same with Endo Black, you can go to their Instagram page to learn more and follow them. They post tons of resources and statistics so that you can learn about endometriosis because we're unfortunately not able to go to our doctors. And then another group, um, that I really lean on that has monthly meetings, which used to be in person, um, but you know, since we are in a pandemic, we've moved to virtual, is the Baltimore Flow run by Stacey Wolfson. And so that's another group um, that posts lots of facts on their Instagram and Facebook page. And then because it's a lot smaller, um, we will also like post and ask for referrals, like such and such has been happening. Has this happened to you? Like, what's your experience been like? How do you, how have you navigated it? So we've, you know, built those communities so that we're able to get support that we're not getting from the traditional healthcare system. That's incredible. I know uh, as a person in recovery, um, that's vitally important to, to, I know my success and, and countless others. And, and thank you for sharing those resources. Although it's, it's cool to hear about our stuff here personally and what you go through, Tracy, that those resources that you just provided to our listeners are, are um, very crucial. So, so thank you for, for listing those for us. And, and perhaps we'll be able to get that out on our website um, another way as well. You, you've, you've also written about how living, um, with endometriosis often means participating in events and or obligations while in pain. You know, how, how does it affect your, your mental health and quality of life? Sure, I mean, I think it runs really deep. Um, like some days I just have to power through things and you know put on red lipstick and scream internally. <laughs> um, that's how I've, you know, also using humor to kind of deal with it. Um, and I thought um, the author, Esme Wang, who wrote The Collected Schizophrenias, um, referred to that really well, um, where she writes about it as putting a, on a costume to seem high functioning. Um, so it's not how I'd prefer to live, but I do it. Um, and I think it's, I'm, I'm trying to really like wrap my head around how, how much it's affected my mental health and quality of life. And I feel like it's just examples of, you know, that pushing through, but then, you know, when I was sickest, I would have to spend the weekend in bed because I worked three events and, you know, I just couldn't not be there. So my weekend is in bed and I'm just sending memes to friends rather than, you know, hanging out as people used to do pre pandemic yeah. uh, or like, I couldn't travel without going into an extreme pain flare. So I didn't really, you know, 
vacation a lot because it wasn't fun. Like what I needed to do was just stay home. Um, so I haven't traveled outside of the United States yet, which perhaps eventually I will be able to do. Um, but that was also just hard because that even meant, you know, from fun vacations to also really struggling to even be able to drive for three hours to visit family. Like then I'm trying to enjoy the company of family, but I'm in so much pain because I, you know, drove for three hours and sat in a car. Did, so you used the, um, the description flare up. Is that, is that, does that really encapsulate what, what it is? So um, it, it's a flare up that you're, you're after that, you need to take rest. It, it, it probably, it sounds like it, um, you, you've developed tools over time, but at the end of the day, pain is pain. And I suppose maybe some people have more mental toughness than others. I don't, I don't, I don't really know. Um, they say that's a real thing and, and, and perhaps it is. Um, you know, there, there are tools as a person in recovery myself, there, there are very real tools I use. The tools for you, what do they look? I mean, I definitely heard taking rest, right? And, and staying away from things that perhaps you know, ignite a, a flare up. Do you, is there, is there medita meditation, perhaps? Sound, I mean, probably in attending one of these groups or one of those settings, um, uh, support groups, however those look. Yeah, so that's how a lot of us talk about it, like a pain flare, because um, I mean, like you mentioned, like tools when you're working through recovery or um, another chronic condition that isn't like endometriosis, but the way people have flares sort of reminds me is Crohn's disease, where you're just like, things are bad now and I've got to deal with it. Um, so because of the way endometriosis, um, maybe this isn't exactly the correct word, but like implants, like where it might be internally affects your symptoms. So we all have different sorts of tools to kind of get through a flare, um, however you have to. Um, and so I will say, also, before I talk about some of the tools, it's just that for a lot of us with endometriosis, um, and I say a lot of us just by from what I've seen through the endometriosis tag on Instagram, because I do follow that to see new research, more resources, um, is that, you know, we're not faking being sick, we're faking being well. So there are all sorts of things that can set someone's symptoms off. And so, you know, some of the things you can do is trying different kinds of ways of eating to reduce inflammation. But again, it's not the same for everyone. Um, a lot of us are big fans of topical CBD um, because that can just help with the inflammation. You know, if you're get, having extreme back pain or if you're having extreme pelvic pain, cover yourself in CBD. Um, staying hydrated is an important part just with helping with the inflammation. Um, meditation can help too, but if anyone ever says, you know, why don't you try meditating or like try some more yoga or go eat kale? Um, I, I just shake my head and pretty you're like, uh, yeah, you're like, try having endometriosis. Like it's probably coming, coming yeah, from someone that doesn't doesn't know. Yeah. Um, there's, um, it's not, it's not just about, you know, eating healthy and your endometriosis goes away. Like there's real tissue, um, that needs to be removed to make your endometriosis go away. Um, and then there's more healthcare related things. Um, so you either need to have the financial security or, you know, a job that gives you really great health care with going to acupuncture has been really helpful with, for me, with how that moves my energy and helps balance my hormones. Pelvic floor physical therapy is highly recommended, but for a lot of people that's out of network. 
and out of you know going what, to wait, Tracy what what was that pelvic what oh yeah so we're just learning a lot today <laughs> yeah we um, are <laughs> so pelvic floor physical therapy is physical therapy for your pelvic floor so it's external and internal work with a licensed physical therapist um where they are able to identify like different I guess I would say like different areas of tightness because if you think about it when you're like let's say you like hurt your arm like you're holding it like you're probably going to hold it and be kind of crunched up until you can go get it maybe get a cast get it treated so imagine having that kind of pain radiating from your core for years. Your whole body is just tense and it takes a lot of work to relieve that tension. I've still got imbalances in my hips because of how my body has pulled itself. So despite being a runner, I've got to be really careful with what how my hips are doing because even though I've been pain free since my last surgery like those imbalances will flare up back pain and hip pain mm -hmm. so pelvic floor physical therapy is and I'll, I'll also say it's for all genders so even if you don't have endometriosis if you feel like there's something going on that's radiating from your core um, a good pelvic floor physical therapist will help figure out what's going on in addition to your other healthcare providers. See that, guys? It was worth staying on this podcast. And then we're probably sitting here, this is all for the ladies, but we, we got something here, guys. You can tell me for. Yeah. It's, and, you know, endometriosis affects all genders too. So I've got trans friends, I've got non binary friends with it. Like it's, that's part of the stigma as well, where, you know, if people consider it a woman's issue, then it just gets relegated into this space of not being taken seriously, of being called hysterical. Right. I want to make sure that we, we spend a ton of time on endometriosis. We want to know a little bit more about you. You're, you're a poet. Um, is it something you do for fun? Or are you, do you publish? Um, what does that look like? Yeah, I have a few books out. Um, and my last chat book that came out from Akinoga Press called To Tracy Like To Like Like. Um, when I look back at it, so it's a small book written in the form of emails to Tracy and to me. <laughs> um, so it's, it's like a digital epistolary book. Um, but when I look back at it, it's really about my journey of trying to get diagnosed with this chronic pain. Like I have a line in it that sticks out to me where I write something like, you know, stay off the radar enough for Blue Cross Blue Shield to take a chance on you. Because once you're stigmatized with a chronic condition, especially before the Affordable Care Act, you know, you could have been denied care because you have a pre existing condition. So a lot of my writing, it's part of it is just something I love to do. But it's also something that I care a lot about professionally because I like the way that a creative work can also be a way of advocacy and giving a voice to something. I really believe that too. And, and so, you know, thank, thank you for being that lit literary artist um, that you just described and, and shared with us. And, and then a library events coordinator in Baltimore. So. What is that? What is a library events coordinator involved in doing? Managing all the adult events at the library I work at. So I oversee what's happening 
at the branch level around the system, but then I also oversee our major initiatives that bring in big speakers. Like we had Elizabeth Gilbert last week virtually. And so that was really incredible to get to hear her story and her perspective. Um, she has this great thing about, you know, embracing her inner crone. So it's, it's all sorts of things like that. So it's a, a really fun, demanding job. I, I imagine during the pandemic, it's, it's certainly been a challenge. Are, are you finding your events more widely attended? Because I guess people don't, they don't have to get up and come. They just, are there, are there more numbers or is it, is it a challenge? We've had really great attendance, which I'm thrilled about um, because we have had people logging in from all over the world, like Australia, um, from England. We had someone from India at a songwriting workshop. So, and in addition to lots of people from around Maryland. So people are still, you know, looking to their library for those resources um, to get them through while we're still social distancing. Yeah, I, I enjoyed on, on one occasion, I was able to work with a library close to us, one of, one of our locations, uh, foundations that's in Baltimore County. There's the Woodlawn Library, right, almost, you know, almost right next door. And so um, right. we, we've worked to be a really good neighbor to them because we were providing treatment. It's like it's like us, them and then a high school. So, you know, it's important to have all stakeholders involved um, with what's going on. We want to make sure that um, if there were any issues with what we were doing them. And it was great because they, they came out and we, we met and um, a really healthy discussion. I always have a, a special appreciation to, for those still involved in, in library systems and, and um, sort of that that community place um, that, that I, I think a lot of times it has a value you know, definitely in the same as, as the community center, a lot of the same th things that um, are, are lost today, um, a place for us to come meet, a safe space for both children and adults. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, th thank you for doing that. And, and really th thank you today for, you know, highlighting um, your life with endometriosis and, and everything that you were able to, to offer the uh, listener today. So there you have it, folks. We're, we're glad that Tracy could shed some light on how living with a chronic illness that is invisible can often have overlooked impacts of mental health. Tracy, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me, Kabir. Of course. If you or a loved one needs help with addiction, call Amethyst today at 855-80-SOBER or visit us online at amethystrecoverycenters.com. You can find all episodes of SHARE at amethystrecoverycenters.com backslash SHARE or download episodes wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for joining us for another episode. I'm Kabir Singh, and we'll see you next time.